In this video, we're going to look at how to find the p-value in a hypothesis test. We'll discover that that has a lot to do with what the alternative hypothesis is. That is, the way you calculate the p-value depends on what the alternative hypothesis is. The p-value is calculated because we know what the test statistic is. Let's review how the test statistic is found. In the case of proportions, we're interested in a random variable that's a categorical variable. We're interested in, in a yes-no question. Does a, an individual have that characteristic or do they not? And we're interested in the proportion of the entire population that has that, uh, that characteristic. The null hypothesis will state one opinion is that the proportion is equal to some given value. We'll take a sample of size n. We'll think about, the, about every sample of size n and consider what the proportion might be for every one of those uh, samples in the distribution of sample proportions. It happens to be the case that the mean of all of these sample proportions is going to be the proportion in the original population. Furthermore, the standard deviation of the distribution of sample proportions is going to be the square root of p, this, the probability of success here, times q, the probability of failure, q is always 1 minus p, divided by uh, the sample size, n. Now, because we know the mean and the standard deviation here, we can transfer any information from this distribution, the distribution of sample proportions, to a z-score. In particular, if we took any p-hat, minus the p-value that's here, and divide that by, sometimes we'll call this the standard error. It'll be easier to write the formula there. Uh, divided by that standard error, the, the standard deviation of the distribution of the sample proportions. That z-value for our p-hat is going to be our test statistic, and we'll use that in calculating the p. The alternative hypothesis comes in three forms. In, the one, in, in one form, p is less than what the null hypothesis thinks it's going to be. Most often, but not necessarily, it, when we have a, a null hypothesis that p is less than p0, we take our sample of size n and we have our successes, then, then in that case, the p hat is generally to the left of the mean here. So p hat is equal to r divided by n, and that ends up being here. What that means is when that gets converted to a z-score, it's generally, in this case, the, the z-score is going to be a negative number. It's going to be less than the mean of the standard deviation. In that case, we're interested in finding the p-value in, in this case, when p is less than p0, we're interested in finding the area to the left of the test statistic. So the p-value is found by looking at p-norm, because this is a standard normal distribution, of the test statistic. The second form that an alternative hypothesis might take is that p is going to be greater than the value that the null hypothesis is claiming it's going to be. In that case, our p hat generally will end up to the right of p. So the p hat that we get from our sample and generally will end up to the right of p in the case of the alternative hypothesis is, is greater than. When that gets converted, then the z value becomes a positive value. So there's our z. When we're interested in finding the p value, that's going to be the area to the right of this. And you know how to calculate that in R. It's going to be 1 minus the p norm 
of z. The final case is when the alternative hypothesis is claiming that p is simply different, not equal to the value that's given in the uh, null hypothesis. In that case, our p hat might end up in either place. Uh, calculating the p value will depend on, on which tail the test statistic turns up in. If the test statistic ended up below zero, in other words, if the, if the z is negative, then we'll take two times this area so that we're getting both tails, this tail and the upper tail. In the case that the test statistic is positive, that is to the right of the mean, then we'll take two times this area, so two times one minus p norm of z. Okay, finding the p values when we're looking at a numerical variable is, is quite similar. We're beginning with the distribution that is maybe normally distributed, might not be, but it's got a mean and a standard deviation. Again, we take a sample of size n. The central limit theorem says that if we looked at, the, at every sample of size n, calculated the mean of each of those samples, and looked at the distribution of those sample means, that we would find that we had a normal distribution under certain assumptions. The mean of this distribution of sample means will be the same as the mean of the original population. The standard deviation of the distribution of sample means will be the standard deviation from this original population divided by the square root of the sample size. In a hypothesis test, there's going to be a null hypothesis that states that the mean of this distribution is equal to some particular value. That's one opinion. If we assume that that opinion is, is correct, then we now know what this mean is. If we also know by some miracle what the standard deviation of this is, then we would know this standard deviation and we could convert all of those things to a standard normal curve. The problem is that we seldom know what that standard deviation of this population is. In fact, we're only assuming that we know what the the mean of that standard deviation is. So we're going to need to approximate this by the sample standard deviation divided by the square root of n. In the because we had to do this approximation, we will use a t-test instead of a z-test. The problem you're working on may have the alternative hypothesis listed in one of three different ways. The first is that mu is less than the value that the null hypothesis said. In that case, it's most likely that the x bar that we get from our sample is going to be to the left of the mean here. When that gets translated down here to a t value, then it's going to be a negative t value. Lower tail test. So our p value is going to be that area. The p value will be calculated as pt of, pt is just a function in R, just like p norm is, pt of t with the appropriate degree of freedom. In this case, the degree of freedom will always be n minus 1. Your alternative hypothesis may state that mu is greater than what the null hypothesis says that it is. Most likely, in that case, the uh, test, uh, the sample statistic that we get, x bar, is going to end up to the right here. When that gets translated to t values, that t value will, will generally be positive. But whether it's positive or negative, doesn't matter, we're interested in an upper tail test. So we're interested in the area to the right of whatever the t value is. That's found by taking 1 minus pt of that value. 
Of course, if we were just looking at PT of T, it would be telling us this area to the left of T. The total area under the curve is 1, so the area to the right will be 1 minus that PT. And finally, if the problem that you're working on is stating that the alternative hypothesis is that mu is not equal to 0, this is a two-tailed test. So then you just pay attention to where the test statistic turns up. If your test statistic was down in this lower tail, then the p-value is going to be 2 times that area in that lower tail, because it's a two-tailed test. So you find the area in the tail that you're at and times it by 2. In the case that our, your test statistic ends up being positive or above the mean, then you're going to take 2 times the area in that tail. So it's just 2 times the, the area in the tail that you're looking at. Okay, that's the idea. Good luck, everybody. Hope it helps.